Hello and uh, welcome uh, to this video uh, video broadcast. Uh, my name is Stuart Wilson. I'm the Corporate Marketing Director at uh, Key Group. Uh, and I'm delighted today to be joined uh, by a number of uh, subject matter experts. And I'll, I'll introduce uh, these guys in, in just a moment. Um, as at the time of recording this broadcast, we're now into, I think it's the fifth week of, of lockdown and uh, an awful lot has happened in that time in this industry. Uh, I think it's fair to say in the first couple of weeks, uh, things got quite sticky in terms of uh, moving this industry forward. There was not really a clear route through uh, in one foul swoop lockdown kind of took away the three uh, legs of the stool, if you like, um, advice, which is predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly done face to face, could no longer happen face to face valuations which requires a valuer to go and uh, physically walk around somebody's property that can no longer happen and legal advice which is legally mandated uh, to be uh, uh, there's a there's a process of face-to-face -face legal advice and the, the requirement of a mortgage deed to be signed uh, meant that um, in one foul swoop this industry uh, could uh, could no longer move forward but uh, I've been working in financial services long enough to know that this industry uh, uh, always manages to find a way through and very quickly I would say managed to find a route through uh, whether it's uh, remote telephone based advice uh, or video based advice which obviously uh, advisors are doing now but also on the valuation side and the legal process side very quickly given the complexity of those subjects uh, this industry has managed to find a way through and it's those latter parts that I wanted to talk about uh, today. So I'm really delighted to have some people who are far uh, better qualified than I to talk about those particular subjects. So I'd like to quickly introduce the, the people that you're seeing on your, your screen today. So we've got we've got representatives from our valuation partners, uh, ESERV, and also from Equilor, one of the uh, most preeminent um, uh, expert legal firms in this market. Um, so we've got, um, uh, we've got from, uh, from Equilor, we've got, uh, um, Claire Barker, uh, welcome Claire, uh, Managing Director, um, and also it's great to have you along today because I know that uh, you sit on the, the Equity Release Council Standard Board, so um, I've got some uh, some points to put to you and I'm sure uh, our advisor audience would uh, would love to hear uh, more about. We've also got um, Elsa Roberts, uh, wel uh, welcome Elsa, uh, who's Operations Director. Uh, at, uh, at Equilor. Um, and from uh, and from ESERV, um, we've got uh, Leon Coles, who's uh, the uh, Regional Operations Director, and uh, Mark uh, Goodfellow, who's the uh, Product Lead uh, at, uh, at uh, ESERV. So welcome to Leon and uh, welcome to Mark as well. Thank you all for joining me this afternoon. And we'll, uh, we've got a number of questions um, uh, that I put together that I think uh, as we've been talking to advisors over the last couple of weeks and I've been on video conference calls with some of the big specialist firms uh, over the last uh, five to ten days and a lot of questions that they're putting to us actually do centre around uh, these issues of valuations uh, and the legal process um, advisors are very very keen to get more insight into uh, into this uh, into this new way of working, this new remote way of working. So I wanted to start um, with the valuation process, if we, if we may. Um, and, uh, um, and Mark, uh, I think um, a question to you, if I may, in terms of what we are now badging sort of remote valuations. Um, uh, that's this is a very different way, of course, of of uh, how we would normally operate in this market with a physical valuation. So can you sort of talk us through at a high level the uh, the way this works and the differences between a, a remote and a physical, obviously apart from the obvious one of a value of not being in the home, but the, the differences between the processes from a, from a valuer's point of view? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, remote valuation is uh, effectively one of three uh, appraisal methodologies that uh, surveying firms uh, and lenders uh, can adopt. Um, the most common one is the, is the physical appraisal uh, in which uh, a surveyor is instructed to uh, attend the property to do a, a, a walk through and a walk round of the property to derive a valuation. Um, a lot of lenders over the past couple of years have uh, switched to uh, what are called uh, automated valuation models. So these are automated valuations uh, using uh, algorithms and historical data 
to provide a, a valuation of a property. Um, also, um, a number of lenders historically have, have conducted what are called drive-bys, uh, whereby a surveyor would effectively drive by a property um, and do a valuation um, from, from the roadside. Um, so over the past couple of years, um, a lot of lenders have sort of uh, questioned the use of drive-bys. Um, um, so as a result of that, he's uh, uh, developed a, a remote valuation product, which effectively does what it says on the tin. It, it's a, it's a, a piece of technology um, that allows a valuer to um, do a, a, a valuation without having to physically inspect the property. Now, um, a lot of lenders, as I say, are using AVM models, um, um, but as, as we go through this COVID lockdown, the, the transactional data uh, will start to uh, deteriorate, um, which will have an impact on the confidence levels of AVMs. So uh, we anticipate that um, the use of uh, automated valuation models may, may reduce over time. So this places more emphasis on uh, the remote valuation product. Um, and what the valuer is presented with is a whole raft of uh, data, property imagery, and other information, which they will uh, use as part of their assessment, but also apply their local knowledge of, of similar properties, uh, local housing uh, demand um, to derive the valuation. So it's a combination of effectively using data technology plus the local surveyor's knowledge to provide an accurate figure uh, of, that, of that property. So with regards to remote valuations, not all properties are suitable uh, for that appraisal methodology. So to manage the, uh, the risk uh, around remote valuations, we agree with each lender a set of uh, risk parameters. And what we will do is when we receive an instruction, depending on the, uh, the suitability criteria derived by the lender, um, we will uh, triage those cases uh, and convert those ones that are deemed uh, less risky uh, to a remote valuation. Uh, and there's a number of uh, data sources that are used to cross-reference the property address to make sure that if there are any issues, for example, that the property is situated within a high flood risk area, then we wouldn't do a remote valuation on that. That would be then allocated uh, to a full physical inspection uh, as when the, the COVID um, social distancing restrictions are, are, are relaxed by government. So that triage process up front is very important to ensure that uh, the most suitable cases are then allocated out to the surveyor. Great stuff. And I, I, I want to sort of come back to those, those sort of data points that you mentioned just a moment ago. But um, uh, Leon, if it, Leon, if I may, I, I think I say there's lots of terminology floating around and some people talk about remote vowels and some people talk about desktop valuations. Is, are they one and the same thing or are they, are they slightly different? Uh, different. Um, and I guess the, the key thing for eServe is the remote valuation. Um, and the significant difference is the fact that we have a local element within it. So all our remote valuations are undertaken by local valuers who are familiar with the area. Um, and desktops tend to be more of a central model where often the valuer has no knowledge of the area physically um, and can cover much wider patches, which naturally increases the risk um, and isn't as accurate. So that's our key point, that the local knowledge is key when undertaking remote valuations, as the valuer makes all the difference to the data feeds that come in and that we receive. So things like school catchment areas, uh, known local defects, amenities, uh, desirability and demand that you just wouldn't know from data if you didn't have that local knowledge of the area. So no amount of data will replace that local knowledge, which helps us combine the knowledge of the, the valuer in the local area and the data to give a much more accurate picture um, without the physical valuation, of course. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Leon. And Mark, back, back to that, um, the, the, the data issue. So can you give us some, a bit more uh, of a walkthrough of some of those uh, additional data points that, that you're using for your remote valuation and how they uh, complement and, and add more flavour and colour to the, to the valuations? 
Yes, of course. So once the job has been uh, determined as being suitable as per the triage criteria, the, the instruction itself is then sent directly out to the valuer on his or her iPad. Now the remote valuation application is a fully integrated uh, mobile app um, and there are effectively six sections that the valuer will, will walk through and complete uh, to uh, sign off the, the valuation. So the first part of the valuation process is what we call as our research uh, section. This is whereby the valuer will um, research uh, various property portals, uh, including Rightmove uh, and Zoopla, to determine whether that property has a digital footprint. So again, they will be using uh, photographic evidence that's been put on uh, marketing portals, uh, looking at the, the property, both uh, interior, exterior, um, to uh, assess the, the, uh, the condition of that individual property. The valuer then also have the opportunity to interrogate the land registry data set to look at previous transactional history. Uh, so what did the property sell for over uh, various uh, time parameters? Um, and then we also then call upon our own data set. So ESA being the, the largest uh, residential surveying firm in the UK, we have a, a whole raft of information um, and volume of, of inspections that we've done. Um, so if we have completed a previous uh, valuation on that same property, uh, the valuer can look at the previous site notes um, and um, uh, derive information uh, from that. We then move into what we class as our view section. And the view section then is a uh, links into uh, Google Maps. Uh, and within Google Maps, we actually draw down the, the land, the, the property boundary uh, from the land registry. So using the eastings and northern coordinates uh, for the property, the valuer is actually then drawn directly to that individual property. So from uh, Google Maps, they've got the ability to look at um, and overlay the satellite imagery. So um, this will give the valuer um, insight into the surrounding uh, streets, neighborhoods, etc. Um, and then as a, using a Google Street View, uh, the valuer will be then dropped down directly outside the, the, the target property, the subject property. Um, and during that process, they will then take screenshots of the front elevation, the streets scene, uh, and that will be attached uh, to, the, uh, to the valuation uh, site notes. The valuer then will move on to what's called the, the property attribute section. So within the property attribute section, there are a number of uh, questions with regards to property age, property style, uh, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, um, floor area. Um, and we draw down uh, those uh, information points from the land registry, the energy performance certification database and um, our data company uh, that we work with, uh, CoreLogic. Um, those are then presented back to the valuer and the valuer will then um, record their own assumptions based on their own research uh, of the property and, and local knowledge. Uh, we also have um, two uh, inbuilt uh, links within the iPad application. One is out to um, the BCIS calculator so that should a lender require the reinstatement costs based on uh, the assumed floor area, uh, that can be provided. Um, and then the final um, data source that we call upon, which is the um, comparable evidence linking directly into the surveyor comparable tool. Um, and now the SCT report is an industry-wide um, data source that surveyors use to identify uh, similar properties uh, and, and provide the comparable evidence and their rationale for their valuation. So there are some of the key data sources that we pulled into the valuation process. And like I say, it's all integrated. So it's a, a seamless workflow without the surveyor having to come out onto Google and search different websites. Um, so that's the, some of the key, key data sources that the value will use. Uh, and as Leon uh, mentioned earlier, overlay that with their local knowledge to, to derive the valuation. That's great. Thank, thanks, Mark. And, and, and Leon, a couple of questions for you, really. I think um, in terms of that process, is this, what's just been described there, quite a, quite a detailed level of, uh, of, of data insight and overlay with local knowledge. So is, is this something that, that is, is elongating the process? Does it take longer for a valuer to go through a, do a remote 
evaluation and also um, uh, what's, what goes on in the background in terms of any uh, kind of auditing of that to ensure that the, the valuation is as accurate as it can be when it's passed on to the, to the lender. Sure. So, so a couple of points there. I'll, I'll start with the time element. Um, it, it's very similar. So at the moment, we're saving the time in actually traveling to the property and inspecting physically. But we are doing a lot more detailed analysis, investigatory work with the data fees that we've got um, to kind of replace that. So th the time element is very similar. And the the SCT that Mark talked about, so the sales comparison tool that we use with Rightmove has always been a key element and takes a good chunk of the time anyway. And that process is exactly the same. So we still go into Rightmove and look for sales um, comparison data that will allow us to justify the valuation. Uh, that process is exactly the same. So I guess the simple answer is it's taking very, very similar amount of time. Um, our big saving is, you know, we're not caught up in traffic. We're not out on the road. Um, and then there's lots of nuances within that that can obviously add delays to the process. Um, so that, that probably answers the time element. Um, and obviously, we clearly state any limitations within the report. So if we are now obviously doing remote valuations as opposed to physicals, we're just caveating that with a, a paragraph to say that obviously due to COVID-19, um, this has been undertaken via a remote valuation as opposed to a physical. Um, and, I, and I suppose the main things that are different there is we're not able to spot Japanese knotweed unless it's clear from, uh, from Google. Uh, very obvious, but um, it's those sort of things that we perhaps haven't been able to factor in, but pretty much el else, everything else is, is there from the data that we have. Um, moving on to audits. So in normal BAU scenario, we would do a lot of audit anyway. We've kind of ramped that up. Um, and one of our key areas of strengths is our real-time audit process. So where we actually audit before the report is sent out, so it's captured beforehand. Um, and it's not an after event process where it's kind of too late. So we've always done that and we've continued to do that. And we've massively ramped up the amount that we're doing. Um, and we do that based on key triggers and key risks. And if, for example, we put a new process in place, so say, for example, more to life, we change your guidance or you change your guidance and we need to implement something, we will, we will ramp up the number of audits that we do for that particular area to make sure that that has been uh, you know, heard loud and clear in the field and, and, the, and the valuers are actually uh, adhering to those processes, which helps us limit those risks. So that kind of is no different. Um, we've just ramped it up. The other areas, again, that we, we do is a manager dip check. So managers are continuing to dip check work to ensure that there's coaching in the moment um, and we're coaching where we, we see perhaps some, something that's been missed or perhaps they, they've tried to upgrade it and we can find a digital footprint that they haven't perhaps managed to look at everything that we, we've been able to find something. Um, and during this period, the big difference is any upgrade now we're asking managers to agree those upgrades before we go ahead with them. So that, you know, in, in all cases where possible, we are able to do the valuation via remote. And, um, you know, that's just the sort of things we're putting in at the moment, um, but we're constantly developing and constantly changing that to, to ensure we are as accurate as possible. Great stuff. And I, 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 we're only, a, I suppose, a couple of weeks now really into uh, mobilizing that. Um, uh, and Morse Life was the first volume lender, uh, along with with ESA, to sort of begin that process of uh, doing these uh, uh, remote valuations on mass. So, is there any uh, any unexpected things that have come out of that process? Any quirks you know, compared to what we would normally see on a physical val, or is it broadly broadly the same? I, I guess the key benefit for us is, although this is new for Morse Life. Um, and we would have ordinarily done a physical. Uh, we've been doing remote valuations now for about two and a half years, uh, probably over that now, come to think about it. Um, and a lot of those initial teething issues you get with any new uh, product or innovation, uh, we've, we've already overcome. So the only challenge, I suppose, or slight hurdle is that because you didn't have a remote valuation process already yourselves, we're having to adapt the mortgage valuation form 
to fit the remote valuation terms. So it, it, it's a very minor thing that eventually we'll be able to solve via our IT partner. Um, but that's probably the only hurdle that slows us down a little bit. Um, and once we overcome that in coming weeks, depending on how long uh, the lockdown progresses, um, you know, that will, that will save us time and, and also help with accuracy because we can automatically map some of those things that perhaps at the moment we're having to manually go in and enter um, based on the guidance that we've received. Uh, but again, like I say, it's a, it's a very minor point. The, the only other thing that we, we are seeing is some cases without a digital footprint. And again, coming back to that point around how long this lasts, we're, we're constantly looking at the moment in the background around what we can do to innovate, what we could actually do to overcome that if this perhaps goes on for longer than we we would like it to so there's always options uh, and all we've got to do is just uh, you know sit down with yourselves and and work out what those options are and agree on the risks and appetite as to whether we go down that route so nothing really is not able to be solved and um, it's just about putting that process in place so to reassure you if things do progress and you know we're, we're, we're not eased at all um, then there are solutions that we can look at as well well, uh, Leon, I want to congratulate you on the timing of your answer because we lost Mark briefly. And <laughs> just as you were coming to the end of your question, uh, Mark's reappeared. So, uh, yes, apologies, internet crash. It's <laughs> going to show this technology uh, has its little quirk. So, Mark, it's uh, good timing because I was going to just ask you one sort of supplementary question and then just wrap up one more question with Leon before we move on to, to Claire and Elsa. But, um, through this valuation process, this new way of working, what, what can advisors expect you? Are they, as they're talking to their clients, can they reassure them that actually valuations are going to hold up through this new process? Or are we going to see uh, a different set of valuations coming out to what we were seeing with physical wells? I guess some of that's tough to call, but is it, is it going to be large, largely the same or are we going to see some differences there? Yeah, no, the, the, the valuations are robust. Um, so again, as part of the product launch that we did uh, in 2017, there was a lot of due diligence and testing um, and the accuracy of remote valuations are comparable to, to the physicals. Um, obviously, the, the use of the, the comparable evidence, looking at similar transactions and properties within the locality is obviously key to, to provide a, a, an accurate uh, valuation. Like I say, the, the, the accuracy of remote valuations is well established. Um, and, and as a result of that, uh, many uh, lenders are using the solution as, as BAU as part of uh, secured lending. Um, so um, the answer to your question is that the, yeah, so the valuations will, will, will hold up um, and uh, your, your, uh, your advice. Oh. Lost you there, Mark. Um, I'll wait for you to. I'll move on. I'll, I'll move on to to Leon just in case. Uh, it looks like Mark's having a few problems with his tech. Um, but Leon, just one one final question. I, I'm not. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to call. Uh, you know what's going to happen in the future. None of us have got a crystal ball on that one. But um, clearly, you guys are speaking to experts across this market, stakeholders across this market. What's the kind of general sentiment? I saw a, a news article a few weeks ago saying that. Yeah, maybe half a million uh, housing transactions are going to be impacted by COVID-19 in one way or, or another. What's the, what's the general mood uh, out there amongst the likes of state agents? Is it, is it reasonably positive and buoyant or are we seeing, um, are we seeing a different sort of sentiment coming through? Yeah, so uh, it's an interesting one, actually, and, and we regularly ask all our valuers to feed into us that information around what they're feeling in their markets. Um, and obviously, coming back to the point that they're all local, so, so we kind of get all that data right across the, um, the UK. Uh, and that feeds into a sentiment call that we have, and that's led by Rick's. Um, and it's a cross industry call where everyone goes onto that call to kind of share that information. Um, and although, you know, it is only anecdotal feedback at the moment and there's, there's nothing hard or concrete, it's been relatively positive. Um, we haven't seen huge amounts of sales falling through. We, 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 ha we are still seeing stuff go onto the market uh, and we are still seeing sold boards go up, uh, even when perhaps not sure quite how they're, they're getting around that with uh, essential, but it is still happening. So like I say, you know, none of us have a crystal ball, but it, 
at the moment is positive. Um, only time will tell, I guess. And, uh, you know, it's very important that as valuers, we don't set the market. Uh, we don't set the market or make the market. We just follow it. And, you know, we, we will start to see evidence. Um, and if we do see any signs of any change, then, then, then we will let you know. But uh, at the moment, um, I think it's positive. Uh, and I guess it all depends on how long the lockdown goes for and, um, you know, what then impact that has on employment and, and various other factors. So that's probably a bit of a summary for you. I know it probably doesn't give you that crystal ball uh, gazing that perhaps we all want, but uh, it gives you a sign of things are reasonably positive at the moment. Uh, it was a very cheeky question of me, Leon, and that's a very <laughs> diplomatic answer. So thank you, thank you for that. So uh, we've lost Mark again, unfortunately. So uh, hopefully he'll come back. But I want to move on now, anyway, to to the legal side. And if I can uh, turn to you, um, Elsa, first. So uh, I think it would be actually be really helpful just to 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 kick us off by just reminding us um, a little bit about the new um, legal process uh, in this sort of new remote legal advice process that's been agreed. Uh, if you could just walk walk us through that. Yeah, sure. I'll just screen share with you a process flow because it is quite a complicated process and the flow makes it a little easier to understand what I'm talking about. I'll just try and share that with you now. Do you have that there? We do, yeah, that's great. Excellent. So just a quick recap on the standard process. We're instructed. We gather information with the client before we get an offer from Mortal Life. Then when we have the offer, we process that offer. We will report to the client about the product. We will send all of the various legal documentation the client needs to execute to the client and our solicitor. We have a fleet of mobile solicitors. One of them will attend the client's premises to execute the documentation, to verify the client's identity and whilst they're there to undertake a capacity assessment and a duress assessment which are that's rule 8.4 of the equity release council guidelines the solicitors then will return to us the documentation we have a an app so they send back digital images of the executed documents and then they send them back in secure recorded post to us that day we can then continue with the process to request completion the key difference in the two processes is, is that the solicitor doesn't attend. The solicitor is interchanged for an independent adult witness of the client's choice. We still have to verify the client's identity. So we need to do that before we can proceed to processing the offer. We also need to process the independent witnesses identity because of course our solicitors, we already have all of their identity verified. And that's done by reference to the client sending us in hard copies of their ID and signing a declaration to confirm that they're happy for us to talk to the independent witness because of course the cornerstone of a solicitor client relationship is confidentiality and by talking to a witness we will be breaching that confidentiality so we need that in writing and we once we have that in writing from the client we will then conduct a call with the client um, video call and different funders have different requirements so this process isn't suitable for all um, if the client has tech, then it may well be able to go ahead. If they don't have tech, there isn't a chance of this process proceeding, unfortunately. But we have to verify that identity. And then we have to proceed to do exactly the same with the witness. We will then go back to the awaiting the, the product offer. When we have that offer, so once you serve have done their best and valued it, we get the offer through to us. We'll then produce our advice to the clients in writing, which we always do because this is a lifetime product, so they need to refer back. And then there will be a telephone or video, depending on the lender's requirements, contact with the client to go through that advice. And the client will then, after that appointment, need to arrange for their witness to attend their property in order to physically witness the execution of the documents. And I think that is the, the key misunderstanding over this change in process, that it, it may be believed that it's an execution only in line with a residential mortgage. It's not because it is equity release and because of the law of property, there must be a physically present independent adult witness for those deeds to be legally executed. 
So I think for most clients, their objective of not wanting the client to visit, the solicitor to visit them is because they are isolating. So they don't want to have a person on their property. Unfortunately, there is no workaround for that because of the Law of Property Act. So they have to have somebody different and that is an independent witness. Great, thank you, thank you for, for talking us um, through that. That's was, was really, really helpful. And, and Claire, I know you, you're in your position as um, somebody who sits on the, uh, the, the standards board of the Equity Release Council. I think um, the, the gold standard, if you like, has always been the face-to-face -face advice that a client receives and the, the independent face-to-face -face legal advice um, that they receive. Um, and, I, and I guess, this must have been quite a challenge yeah, to, for, for, for the industry to find a way through this that allows the industry to carry on, allows clients to continue on their journey, their equity lease journey, uh, while still maintaining the, the, the high quality bar that rightly the council wants to, uh, wants to maintain. What, what, what's that been like from your perspective on the inside of that, uh, that, that process? It, it really, you're absolutely right. It's been a huge challenge um, because um, we talked about it at the standards board before lockdown was ever really actually thought to be likely to happen um and my, my initial reaction was there's no way we can do this remotely um, um actually as a firm we've we've always done face-to-face -face legal advice but um other firms haven't done and um, it's only really since 2014 that it's been mandatory in fact and what's interesting about this is the firms that didn't used to do face-to-face -face are absolutely still gunning for face-to-face -to, -face to be still remaining the gold standard um, and to return to it as soon as possible. And in fact, not to even deviate to a remote legal advice model now if they can avoid it. And that's exactly where we sit. Um, we've had many uh, conference calls. We had about sort of, uh, when we were trying to develop this, you were absolutely right to say it was a rapid, rapid fire process with a lot of consultation, both with the council um uh, being being the standards board the main board and then with the solicitors um who obviously will have to adopt this process there's a real challenge i think because uh, there's a there's a very big difference between how various firms operate and i think it's been very difficult since we locked down for high street firms to operate on a on a, on a face to face basis because it's not been possible for clients to go into their offices um, for us it hasn't been so much of a challenge because our mobile agents are still very much able to go and see the clients whilst not exactly classed as key workers, um, they are still carrying out what um, is very important financial services work for clients of an age. So um, actually that hasn't been as much of a challenge as, as we thought it might be. Mm. Um, but in terms of um, returning to gold standard, I think that's absolutely paramount um, for the reasons that Elsa's outlined. Um, there are a number of hurdles within this process and deliberately so. Um, and one of one of the major challenges for us was, you know, things like why are you asking for um, a ID for the witness, for example, which isn't actually a legal requirement. Mm -hmm. And we built that into this process because we want to make sure that we're avoiding fraud and, um, you know, the idea that down the line we find out that somebody makes a claim against this client and 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 this well, who witnessed who witnessed that deed? Turns out that person doesn't exist. Or didn't exist so um, it's really important to to have tried to create as robust a process as we could possibly dream up and it has not been designed to be easy to follow necessarily um, or um, a get around or an execution only it's very much designed to try and reflect as far as possible the robust standards within the um, original face-to-face -face process mm. and I, I, I guess you kind of touched on it there in, in some of in some of that response but um, uh, as as, you, as we think about a client that's about to go through that legal process, what were the uh, uh, through to the point where they they sign a mortgage deed and and uh, and that allows a, a case to obviously they move to to completion. Yeah, what what are the key uh, issues that are being faced? What what are, what are the sort of concerns that are coming through from from clients? Is it, is it the 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 fact they've still got to have somebody coming into uh, onto their property, the signature of the deed? What what are the sort of concerns that are coming through on that? I think there is a concern before we've had a full conversation with the clients about somebody coming to witness the deed. But we moved to um, a, a contactless solicitor, 
I think it would probably be towards the end of February when COVID started to gain a pace and we could see what was happening, happening in China and then rolling through to Italy. We started to adapt and adopt social distancing straight away, given our demographic of clients. And when we, we explain to clients exactly how we foresee this working, so we've altered our sort of gold standard in terms of we're making sure there is advice on the telephone beforehand and then the solicitor attends they do that at a, an appropriate social distance they've been very resourceful a lot of our solicitors have been doing appointments in gardens etc they're using full ppe because we managed to obtain that before the current ppe crisis happened um, and all of them are providing weekly risk assessments to confirm they've not been any in any contact to ensure that they are as least culpable of contributing towards the spread of this disease as uh, this pandemic as they can be. The concern is exactly that though, having a stranger on the property and that just cannot be avoided because it is set in legislation. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would echo that. I mean, one of the, one of the first things that people say is, you know, Claire, why aren't you why aren't you going back to the council and getting them to relax requirements about um, having to have documents witnessed uh, physically? Why can't we just do it on a video call? And it is Law of Property Act, and that's backed up in case law as well. So it's not just a question that, that we can just change that. That's not going to happen anytime soon. I know it's it's in consultation, but uh, that's going to be down to the Law Commission to sort out down the line. Um, but I don't suppose it's a priority right now. No, no, understood. And and. Uh, it, it's interesting what you just said there, Elsa, about obviously your your guy, you guys going out with uh, PPE. We're talking about um, customers uh, that are potentially vulnerable, potentially highly vulnerable people. And, and um, Claire, in terms of the the vulnerability side in particular, um, it's true, isn't it? In terms of spotting vulnerability, that's that's a lot harder to do, isn't it? When you're remote from somebody, it's when you're physically in front of a, an individual, you can pick up on visual clues, body language, things that are going on around in the environment. Much harder to do if it's being done over over a video call. What what's what what's the um, what's your take on that in terms of the the impacts that are on, on uh, vulnerable customers here? I think it's really hard, and I think that's why um, there needs to be a really really um, detailed risk assessment at the beginning of a case as to what's likely vulnerability um, is going to be on this for example talking to the client quite a lot at the beginning about what they're doing why they're doing it why they're doing it now um, can they wait um, can, why can't they have a face to face and, and one of the questions i think as well is um, if they say immediately for example we don't want a solicitor at our house um, but they are prepared to have you know a friend or neighbor at their house what why what's the objection um, and is that because somebody is pulling the strings is that is there an issue um, are they in control so there's a lot of nuanced um information really around this and it's not going to be a black or white this is definitely possible to go down this route or it or, or it isn't i think you've got to do a lot of fact finding and understand that the, the client's family dynamics and really try and front load that process as much as possible mm. um and if you do decide i think that that it is possible to go down the remote legal advice um service then it, it, you've just got to have as many contact points with that client as possible um, and we've built four in which um, are designed really to try and develop a rapport with that client to try and understand all of their all of their um, circumstances reasons and needs and, and everything else and to compare and contrast that with what the financial advice so it's a lot more about sharing information as well within this process and that could be also via the surveyors but from from whatever they're, they're finding with any contact from the, from that client um, but you're absolutely right. There is no subject to, su substitute rather to than to go around to somebody's house and to actually look into the whites of their eyes and really understand what they're doing, and actually to um, to go into the house to actually see the state of it, so to understand its condition, um, look around, look around photographs, for example, that might be sitting on there. Even the smell of the house actually um, will give you some clues as to how people are living. Um, and without being able to do that, obviously we can't do that on a video call, but we're, we're doing as much as we can. And uh, one of the things that we're, we're, we're trialing is um, if we use, if we use this process is going to be speech emotion recognition so that from contact point one, um, we start developing speech patterns with the clients so that we understand if we feel that they're under duress as time goes on. 
Um, and if somebody else is there, not holding a gun to their head, we don't we don't imagine, but essentially um, really trying to push them down the route of taking the money out. Mm -hmm. And we think that the risks are heightened at the moment because so many people are unfortunately losing their jobs. Um, and naturally enough, um, families are going to be crying out for the bank of mum and dad. Of course. On, yeah. on, I think on the flip side of that, though, um, families will want to help, will want to help out children. So it's not always a, a bad news story. Yeah, so it's really interesting. It's a really interesting point. And I, I think um, uh, that's something we want to come on to in a separate webinar. Actually, we've got a, we've got a whole uh webinar dedicated to vulnerability based on uh, some updated research we've done with advisors so um for anyone watching this if you're interested to to know a bit more about the subjects of vulnerability and some insights into uh vulnerable clients and how advisors are viewing that um uh, please do tune into that we'll be we'll be doing a, a webinar in a couple of weeks time but just a couple of final points um to uh to you Al. so i think um in terms of this process it sounds as though correct me if i'm wrong it sounds as though it's, it, this is probably going to take a little bit longer and perhaps than it would have ordinarily done when we were doing uh before the lockdown um is there, is there anything that advisors can or should be doing to sort of prep their clients up front before they get to the point of uh, the legal process to, to help um uh, ease them through that do you think yes absolutely i think the advisors perhaps need to talk through the the standard process and actually understand the difference between the two processes not every case is going to be suitable for this stay at home procedure because there are a number of different filters for example if the client doesn't have photo id and isn't sufficiently tech savvy to be able to engage via a zoom conference or similar that's probably going to stop the case from proceeding on that basis anyway different lenders and funders have different criteria. so again they need to really know their products or just be sufficiently generic in advice regarding the stay at home procedure and then they've got to find this independent witness those witnesses may they will need to have id but they may not be willing to engage with us so they might fail on their their first attempt and then we're going to have to see documentation going back and forth so the client needs to be prepared that they're going to have to be quite involved in driving this process forward at the moment the way the process is honed after sort of many years of experience in it it's very streamlined we manage that process so it's very convenient and it goes through very quickly and very smoothly this is going to be relying on a client who doesn't have that familiarity who's going to have to find documents for us who's going to have to organize a witness to come round to them They've, there's even the small practical considerations such as when those documents are signed what's going to happen to them how are they going to get back to us because they've got to go in the post to come back to us are they going to be entrusted to standard post or is somebody going to go out to get them recorded delivery and for every moment those documents are not in the client's ownership or ours there's a risk there of that documentation containing confidential personal information going astray all of those things add to the anxiety of this remote process and i think advisors need to when they're engaging with their clients get to understand them because i think this will worry a lot of clients we're dealing with a vulnerable prospect and the process that is in place in normal times is designed to be as stress-free as it can be whilst getting the legal process um, done to the satisfaction of the lenders such that the clients can achieve their objective that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for your for your input today. I just I just do one final um, round, uh, and I'll go in order that you appear in. It's a bit like the Brady Bunch. This, <laughs> so I've got, I'll go. I'll start with Claire. But um, just say, uh, we, look, we're only we're five weeks in, uh, or well, this is the fifth week of lockdown. I think. Um, who knows how much longer we've got? At least another couple of weeks, maybe a little bit longer. And social distancing likely to go on. Who knows? Uh, perhaps even towards the end of the year. Perhaps even into next year, if you believe some of the more pessimistic stories. But what, what's your sort of personal outlook of of how things are going to progress over the next few weeks, and how advisors should um, be thinking and and adapting to this new world? Claire, if I could start with you in terms of your outlook. 
Yeah, um, I, the, well, the, the reasons that people are going to do equity release and the need for that equity release product hasn't changed. Um, and I think uh, my own personal view is that I think it's going to be a little bit like last year was with Brexit. And I think it will be the people that, that do the equity releases will be the people that need to do it, not the lifestylers. So I think people who are doing it for the lifestyle, the holidays and everything else will obviously hold off. Um, and the uh, the people that need to do it um, for debt recovery um, reasons or helping family and all of that sort of stuff, I think that they'll they'll probably carry on. But I think there will be some real concern around um, self isolating. I was out for a walk this morning with a dog, and uh, you know, you, I, I met met somebody who's over seventy, and she's very very concerned about seeing you know neighbours inviting friends around and that sort of thing. So. I think, I think the fear is, is out there and, and, and that's going to take some getting over, to be honest. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And Leon, same, same sort of question to you. What's your, what's your take and look, outlook? Uh, yeah, I guess um, no one really knows, I guess. But all I can say is we're staying very, very close to government guidelines. Um, we're planning for every eventuality. So we're already looking at ways in which we can move to the next stage if we have to. Um, we're, we're used to change anyway, so um, the industry has been through quite a bit of change over the last couple of years anyway. Um, and we will continue to inv inv uh, sorry, innovate and change in order to adapt to whatever situation is thrown at us. Mm. Um, we're, we're already looking at provisions for PPE, we've got some in stock and looking at right if we can start to get out and do some form of physical inspections, uh, we're ready for it. Um, so it's just to reassure you really that we're, 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 we're okay, um, we'll continue, uh, we still have full national coverage um, and obviously we'll do everything we possibly can to support you and your customers in the, in the foreseeable future uh, and that's it for me really. Great stuff and also you, you, you touched on it just a moment ago in terms of the things that advisors probably need to be uh, prepping themselves for and prepping their clients for but uh you know what, what's your what's your take on on uh, the next few weeks and months is it is it still really uncertain do you think or, or from a legal process point of view do you think we'll, we'll start to get to, into a groove with this and, and things will become a little bit more uh a little easier for people to get their heads around do you think I think that probably depends on what the government decides to do with for example mortgage holiday payments because a lot of equity releases are redeeming existing residential mortgages and the clients come under pressure because that product's come to an end At the moment there's a mortgage holiday there so the existing residential lenders will not be pressing for that to be repaid at this time once that's lifted i think it puts a different complexion on matters because people are put under pressure at the moment that whilst they might not be able to meet that mortgage or it's come to the end of its term there isn't the pressure to deal with it or the threat of litigation once that comes back into the picture the clients are in a very difficult position because there are all the government guidelines there are the requirements to isolate so it depends on what stages of undoing the current sanctions or how they happen as to how this looks but let's hope that we don't lift mortgage payments in that holidays and keep in place the current restrictions because that does put the clients between a rock and a hard place on those type of cases mm. and you know we want to help clients we want to help them achieve their objectives quickly and safely both physically and from the data safety yeah absolutely absolutely and mark sorry we we lost you again a little bit earlier uh you're back with us again i am um, so, um, apologies I'll, I'll come to you finally just as a final sort of view from yourself and uh, uh how you you'll sort of out your outlook for the next few weeks and months as we move through this crisis yeah as we move uh, into the uh, the equity release market uh, this is a, a sort of a new area for for a lot of us um so i'd be very keen to encourage your advisors to share any uh, examples of, of good practice that may be working uh, issues or uh, challenges or things that aren't working so that they can share and we can uh, look to adapt and uh, innovate to try and uh, improve the process for parties involved fantastic well listen guys I, I really do appreciate your time this afternoon thank you so much for joining me claire and leon and elsa and mark uh, really uh, that was a great chat and some really good insight there and uh, walking us through those those various processes that we're all you know gradually getting our gradually getting our heads around and, and and working out how all this fits together so thank you 
for your time. Uh, and thank you uh, for, for watching today. Um, as I said, we are running lots of uh, webinar content, new webinar content over the course of the next few weeks, including that uh, presentation on vulnerability that I mentioned. Um, so watch out uh, for, your, uh, for information and news on that in your inboxes, and you can find information on our website as well. But uh, for now, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us, and we'll catch you on the, on the next program. Thank you very much.